Okay. And the threat is that any extra time we take cuts into the tea. So. Oh, I see. I see. I see. <laughs> it's a threat more for them than for you. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's for <laughs> me you. too, I think. <laughs> All right. I'll just come to the discussion that we had. We had an intensive discussion on constitutional and legal issues that came out. Uh, that, that was the mandate for us. You can see the mandate. Unprotected status of rivers and river conflicts was what we were discussing. We discussed a lot about conflicts, conflicts from various parts of the country around, uh, around uh, water issues, around water sharing issues, dis river disputes around uh, river and rivers, you know, from examples from Odessa, Bhagalpur, Gujarat, um, and you know, many other states we discussed a lot. Some of, these, some of the discussion points I've just kept here, we decided to keep it to the unedited version of what was discussed for the records. So I'm not, not going to run through this, but you can see that there are many themes that we're discussing. And each one of us had a lot of things to say about uh, things that needs to be reformed and corrected. So all of that is there in the first few slides that you'll, you, you, you look into. I'll just skip these and come to the last four slides where we want to give you specific recommendations, but it will give you a sense of the kind of issues that we were talking about, essentially. And uh, the type of conflicts that came up uh, uh, in the discussion interstate to competing uses to knowledge systems, institutional issues, and so on and so forth. Maybe just, I'll just begin from here in the interest of time. The one conflict that we actually you know, felt very strongly about as a group was this conflict over knowledge systems over the river. How do you understand rivers and all? Because of its direct implication for policy and lawmaking in this country. Because it seems to have, there seems to have, you know, uh, uh, information, the, uh, the, those who are making policies and laws need you know, have a system, have, a, have, a, have their own understanding of how they look at rivers and how they want to look at regulation and management of rivers, uh, which may not necessarily be one you know, which should be shared by others. So this, is, this, is, this, this, this very fact itself leads to a lot of exclusion within the policy and law making process, which, is, which, we, thought, which we thought was one of the things that, that needs to be recognized. And uh, going ahead, if you want, if you want to create uh, legal frameworks that addresses the problem, you need to make it as inclusive as possible. So, so that that's 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 one that that came out. We began with the discussion on the constitution, and uh, we recognized that constitution talks about rivers in a very restrictive context, essentially in the context of disputes, and the context of regulation and development. That's all. So there is no proactive vision within the constitution itself that that can be said. You know to be uh, uh, laying down a vision that helps protect rivers, per se, in that sense. There, you know, uh, we spend a lot of time discussing about what can be done about it, and there were suggestions that, you know, can we talk about the right of a river, uh, uh, in, in, a, in, in a sense, and uh, there was some confusion that prevailed, that, you know, could it be integrated with the right to water discourse that is there in the Constitution under Article 21, as you know, right to life has been read to be, uh, include within it the right to water and right to environment. So there were discussion as to how we can, how, we, how that right could be formulated. We left it at an open-ended level, but we recognize that, you know, something needs to be grounded in the constitution, which proactively speaks about protection of a river in a, in a direct sense. And if you look at the second point there, right of a river to be an ecosystem needs to be legally acknowledged. This is something that came out repeatedly. In the, I've been seeing this Yamuna Manifesto, you know, that, that's there with you. And the page one, I think it somewhere says that a uh, river is basically a report card of, uh, the, 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 of, the, of the basin, you know. So uh, the, uh, the, and, and it, the, the fact that it's a landscape uh, level system in itself, this recognition legally is not there. Constitutionally, it's not there. Legally, it's not there. So this is, this is the big height. This is, this is the big, big point, you know, where you have to look into uh, uh, the constitutional legal reforms. You know, this is, has to be the starting point. Recognition of rivers is a common essential, and therefore we came down to the discussion on uh, you know uh, uh, what has been the effort made so far on, on you know looking at a basin-wide approach to managing rivers, and you know, some discussion came around a draft that was prepared by the last government on a river basin management bill. But it had its own lacuna, its own deficiencies. But it, it seems to be actually recognizing in principle at least that, you know, uh, that a basin approach towards managing rivers is something that uh, is an idea whose time has come. And one sense that, you know, uh, uh, that at least, you know, in, in the formal circles, people are talking about the fact that 
this is the way ahead. But there seems to be a lot of ambiguity around it. What should be the ideal way of approaching and regulating basins? What should be the way the structure needs to be involved around that? How, how could the river basin organization be created? You know, and uh, so all of that, there's, there's some confusion around it. There are some processes at work, some funding agencies which actually promote RBOs in some senses, but they talk about RBOs in a very restrict, uh, restrictive context. So, so there is the discourse that is emerging, and we need to be very clear as a group as to wh where we stand on that and how we look at basin-wise regulation of rivers. This could be a starting point of uh, uh, the bill that you spoke about, but we need to firm up our way ahead going, uh, going on this. There was some discussion on the River Conservation Zoning Act, which Professor Gopal, I don't know if he's here or not, but he spoke at length about the fact that this is something which is on the anvil and should closely, should, should soon become a, uh, uh, take the shape of a law in some senses. I think it is going to be notified under a notification under the Environment Act. That would be the, that, that would be the strategy ahead. But this is something that, uh, that uh, uh, needs to be seen closely by, by all of us. Uh, I don't think we need to repeat this point, but except to say that the river basin organization needs to be democratic and inclusive. This is the this is the key point of it. How do you manage? How do you how do you go ahead in this uh, on this aspect? Do you need to do a river basin planning? Do you need to prepare master plans for river basins? How those plans could be prepared? How what are, you know how, what are the structures that could come through? This this occupied some space, you know, while we're discussing this. Uh, then we came down to the interstate issues, interstate river water disputes, and there was some discussion around that also. Uh, the fact today is that in the Constitution you talk about, uh, there's an Article 262 and, and Entry 56, which talks about how interstate water disputes are to be managed. There are existing, the existing approaches to create tribunals, and, and, uh, and the tribunals are vested with the responsibility of managing disputes. So that's how the Constitution look at it. And we felt that you know this is something it's not giving the results that's required. That disputes tend to take a lot of time, and uh, there is no proactive approach to preempting disputes, for example, or ensuring that the states can speak to each other rather than at each other when they when they when they are with the before the tribunal. So that distinction is there, and the, the space that was created, the Interstate Water Council, which had a mandate for coordinating interstate issues, has uh, has never delivered. Has never, in fact, been functional on these aspects. So. Need to how do we look at that space and can we can we can we can we look at it uh, more closely? Is one thing that came out. Uh, need to deepen the dialogue beyond governments to include riparian stakeholders. This is an issue that came repeatedly. I've also mentioned it in other contexts. Uh, the whole thing of EIA, the 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 environment impact assessment needs to be looked through. This politics of having 24 megawatt project and then excluding it out of the purview of EIA needs to be addressed. So any intervention that impacts the, 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 the ecosystem, uh, the integrity of a, um, uh, the ecosystem of a river needs to be brought within the purview of EIA, something that was strongly felt uh, for, for micro hydro projects also. Uh, EIA and perhaps a cumulative EIA uh, should be the way ahead is uh, one of the things that came out. The next point was important, which is on the data sharing. This is at the sea. If you look at the conflicts, conflicts were one of the under, was the theme that we we were addressing. Conflicts exist and you know uh, uh, continue to exist because of the lack of data that you know people have on it. So people tend to take positions without without uh, in the in the absence of information that they have. States have the, have not made any uh, effort proactively to disclose data around it. So this is a huge gap in itself. Why? This, the group felt very strongly about it. What, why is the water data you know, seen as a, as a, perhaps a security issue or something that, you know, it's like a military data or something that people don't uh, want to share it? Why is it that those data books that Central Water Commission, for example, has not easily available in the public domain? So this is, this is an issue that came out. And the other thing is also important, need for agreed upon data sets. Because if you go to the tribunals, I've been part of some of the tribunals, I can see that, say that personally. States don't speak to each other on the data that they have on water allocation. So, so Goa versus Maharashtra versus Karnataka on the same river, what is the water availability, what is the water allocation? States also keep fighting with each other. So there is no agreed upon data sets and that is one of the source of conflicts uh, that, per, that, uh, um, that exists today. So perhaps this needs to be mandated somehow. A mandatory regime may need to be created for you know, working more with the information system that we might have. Uh, the next point was the, on the... Uh, Series of amendments to fix accountability of authorities. If you look at the laws, the environmental laws that you can use for, for uh, protection of rivers, 
the one uh, one thing where they are absolutely common is that when it comes to the accountability of the pollution control boards and the and the appraisal authorities, you know, there is absolutely nothing that the laws have to offer. And with the result that it's obvious that you know there have been no prosecution against those who have been who have uh, who have uh, failed to 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 man those legislations. There have been recent the recent efforts to create new legislations in other areas, domestic violence act and the others were cited, where there is an effort, conscious effort made to create sort of a liability against the government departments at, you know, at work on the, uh, mandated to work under those legislations. Why can't these legislations in this area have that approach is one of the things that came out strongly. Uh, then the, the, the next point was also important and I think this again was uh, uh, members in the group were very vocal about. <clears throat> well, the fact that when you go to the Supreme Court against um, a project uh, and uh, wanting to stop a project, the Supreme Court would basically be interested in allowing it and saying, you know, using political based principle and giving, saying that the project proponent could be faltered and, uh, and, and uh, compensation could be given for that. So this approach, which is grounded essentially in civil liability, which, uh, where everything, we have used the word compensatory jurisprudence, where, you know, you, 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 you stop at a particular point but don't go further. You don't go further in terms of stopping the, the, the project, stopping the particular activity, or putting behind bars people who are responsible for what they're doing, is an approach that might work in the dominant space within the environmental discourse. National Green Tribunal has come, which actually works only in civil liability. So this, this dominant discourse today is to emphasize more and more on polluter based principle and civil liability. But this approach may not be enough for a river now, because the river, as the theme of the conference here it is, River is in a crisis, and nationally we need to agree that offences against river needs to be seen far more seriously than that, and therefore require an approach that should be grounded in criminal liability in much more stricter sense than, 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 than civil liability in that sense. So this is again one, one theme that came. And uh, the, the uh, theme of uh, this, this, the economic approach towards regulation uh, was also subject that we discussed. Factoring and accounting in the ecological costs in all the uh, in, um, in river management is something that came out. Uh, we need to have pre preventive strategy to promote cleaner production, and how does the policy uh, uh, framework respond to that? Uh, polluters, pays have not and will not stop degradation of rivers is one of the one of the uh, conclusions that the group came to, uh, which ties up with the earlier point. Uh, I guess this, these these are the things that we discussed uh, more closely. There were a lot of discussions around other themes. There are others in the group, Suresh and Joy and and uh, Ji is there. Anyone who wants to add on to this, free to add on. There are lots of issues that we discussed. Uh, and uh, I think we can't capture most of it today. But these are the themes that came out very strongly that, as a group from, from our side uh, going ahead on this. Thank you. Thank you. First, uh, we'll see if anybody from the group wants to add anything. Is there anybody from the group? You're from the group? Okay, we'll start with you and then, uh, then we'll come to the more open <coughs> to the other groups. conflicts create create state policies create recognize rivers rivers society conflicts conflict state actions state framework मीडिएट करके लॉ मेकिंग से उसको जो है कॉन्फ्लिक्ट्स को शांत कर सके तो ये यहां पे ये बात आती है कि जो इसका लॉजिक है स्टेट का जो हमारा कानून का शास्त्र है जिसको ब्रिटिश जुरिस्प्रूडेंस कहते हैं उसका लॉजिक ये है कि वो उस कॉन्फ्लिक्ट को शांत नहीं कर सकता है इसलिए हमको थोड़ा गहराई से उसके ऊपर भी विचार करना पड़ेगा कि क्या जो यहां पे जो सुप्रीम पोजीशन है यहां की सोसाइटी पे यहां की ज्योग्राफी पे जो ब्रिटिश जुरिस्प्रूडेंस का फ्रेमवर्क हमारे कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में है उसके अंतर्गत इसका कोई सलूशन नहीं हो सकता है इसलिए लीगल इसका कोई रेमेडी नहीं है थैंक थैंक यू द लिमिट्स ऑफ लॉ एक्चुअली जैसा मेरा मानना है कि वी डोंट लैक एनवायरमेंटल लॉज देयर आर सो मेनी एनवायरमेंटल लॉज इन आवर कंट्री the issue is the proper implementation and the enforcement of the laws. If we say uh, implement Water Pollution Act in proper spirit, the issue of the pollution of the river will be dealt, uh, can be dealt greatly. Now, yes, we need now river-specific laws. 
as we discussed in our group to protect our flood plains, we need river regulation zone. Yeah. But how to ensure the proper implementation and enforcement of these laws is something I need <laughs> to enlighten myself from the group, since you, you have so many legal experts. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yes, now the major source of pollution to our river is from the industries jinka uh, ki product we are export, exporting to the other countries the developed nation has shifted the many polluting industries because they have find no solution to fix that pollution and now it has been shifted to our countries in a sin reason so uske liye how it can be le legally addressed Jaruri hai ki hum yeh leathers hai, tanneries hai, dye industries hai, textile, how to regulate these industries? We are not using and consuming those products. We are just exporting those things. How this issue can be addressed legally? Thank you. Actually, I have only six hands up, so I'm going to request people not to raise their hands because they're going to run at the feet. And respond to him as a part of the world. Well, I'll give the group a last one. <coughs> Group can decide one of the first points. There are six names already. And then we can decide if we want to get into the key session. We can have more questions. So you have to decide. There was a step. After that, Rabi and Suresh, and then Nitin, and then all of you. Then we see if we have more time. Then the river should not be privatized. That slide. Where? It is. Where you said the river should not be privatized. One second. So I just want to say. Huh. No stretch of the river huh. yes, to privatize. Right, right. Hmm. So uh, when we are talking about privatization, so we have to like, very clearly spell out like what we are talking about the privatization because yeah. we have seen if it is privatized, if it is not privati privatized. Because when we talk about privatization, it is actually the uh, government says we, we, are, uh, <coughs> we are regulating the extraction of, suppose take an example of sand mining. Okay. So now what I have experienced in my UP in Allahabad field is that there were many tribal people who used to draw sand from, they used to do sand mining by hand for that. But then uh, their NGT order came, all these things came. So they said you have to take uh, clearance, all those things you have to take. And if you uh, see, it as, see it as a uh, 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 like common resource, then we have seen like what happened in Noida. Builders are taking uh, so much of sand. So in that sense, are you talking about privatization or corporatization or we have, we have to like somewhere we are, you know, we have to debate on that. Mm. I request the comments to be brief. Uh, I just want to raise one issue. Of the issue of uh, institutions and governance. So we think of laws and legislation, but I'm very unclear about the institutions of mm. governance. And right. I'm, I think this is not thought about enough, especially when you talk of new uh, ecological spaces as uh, institution, because laws require some institutional uh, yeah. governance. Mm. But they're always relegated to the same institutions we already have. Mm. So the same CWG, etc., will be Correct. regulating the river. Do we want to spend some time, not today, but as a group, to think about, if we think of a river conservation zone, what is the institution's mechanisms for, which will be invested in that, mm -hmm. in that idea? Right. Fixing accountability, you know, outsourcing of pollution uh, by other countries. We discussed this in detail, and that's where the question of accounting for the ecological cost. So we are saying that you cannot just get away by dumping your pollution into our country and our rivers. So that was de uh, discussed in detail. And the second quick input was that we discussed about uh, providing a le legal protection to pristine rivers. You know, a lot of our rivers, smaller rivers, are still pristine, and there is a there was a recognition in the group that we need to sort of look at legally protecting them so that they are prevented from degradation. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, ideally, uh, we should look at uh, at least 100 year flood line as HFL. So if you are talking about just 50 okay. years, then you are actually lowering your uh, uh, this thing. So I mm. think Okay. I think one, one important aspect that uh, adds to the conflicts, sharing of rivers, whatever goods and services, is the climate change. That, that, that is missing here. If you look at the Himalayan crevice here, 
almost for the last 50, 60 years, we have lost 20% of the mass. Mm -hmm. And if I look at the stream flows in the Himalayan region particularly, and there was some discussion that in, uh, in the peninsular rivers also, there is a statistically significant decline in the stream flows. I mean, that need to be reflected. Mm. When, when we add the, let, let's talk about the Indus Water Treaty or even the interstate treaties. When those treaties were signed, the climate change paradigm did not reflect in mm. those treaties. Mm. So the total stock, the total mm. volume of water has reduced how to share it. Mm. I think this component has to reflect somewhere in okay. the recommendations. So, uh, I think we will have stopped the questions here. I'm going to give one minute to Rohit uh, to respond. He said on behalf of the group yeah, he wants yeah. to respond. With reference to the beam point, we discussed in detail in about environment law, uh, implementation issue. Uh, let me say one thing that today the laws are not enough, not well articulated in number of sense, so I don't buy that argument because otherwise we pollute and pay or pay in advance and pollute. There's no problem if you look at the judicial activism also. But the thing which we mentioned in our slide about accountability of the state yes. is because of that. Yeah. In all like, like right to information, number of act, people, the, those who are in charge of those are made accountable. Prosecute them also. Because otherwise, if state is not accountable, that is what we discuss in detail and we mention in our slide. Mm. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Vijay also wants to respond quickly so we can uh, No, just finish with I think you have partly said what I wanted to say. Implementation is definitely a big issue and it's an issue that we discussed at length. But it doesn't hide away the fact that there are issues in formulation of law also. So there, it's, it's no either or here, it's both. So that's, that's, that's one thing that you wanted to say on that. And um, uh, the issue of uh, institutions and all, it's something again we discussed. Pollution control board for, is a good example, for example, why it's not been able to deliver. There are institutional deficiency within that also. There are 10 inspectors for 2 lakh industrial units within the pollution control board. There are so it's a, it's a larger problem. The, the, Law and the institutions don't speak too well with each other also. If you look at the Water Pollution Act, the Air Act, the mandate that the Pollution Control Board has is very wide. And the kind of powers and the, the kind of ability that they have, capacity that they have, is very narrow. So there are issues which goes beyond the law in that sense, strictly into the institutional domain too. And so there is a larger problem that needs to be sorted out, it needs to be revisited. We discussed as a group, we discussed that. But, but, but in terms of recommendations, what we need to think through and go forward on this is something that we we, we held ourselves back and see is what we can say about that in the future. That's all I want to say. Okay. So